Thank you very much. Thanks to Ford and Loyola, and uh, I'd said Fordham because I just met someone, but uh, Loyola and the Presence for having me here. It's, a, it's an honor. It's great to be back in Chicago. I have so many great memories of Chicago, good friends here. Uh, it's wonderful to come back. I'm going to break this in half, and the first uh, part of this talk is going to come from this book called Zero at the Bone, which I'm publishing next month. The subtitle is 50 Entries Against Despair, so it's 50 chapters, actually 52 chapters, it has zero on each side, but, but all of these essays and poems and uh, other strange things in this book link up with that uh, problem of despair. This is called I Will Love You in the Summertime. 30 years ago, watching some report about depression and religion, and I forget the relationship, but apparently there was one, a friend who was entirely secular asked me with genuine curiosity and concern, why do they believe in something that doesn't make them happy? I was an ambivalent atheist at that point, beset with an inchoate loneliness and endless anxieties, contemptuous of Christianity but addicted to its aspiration and art. I was also chained fast to the rock of poetry, having my liver pecked out by the bird of a harrowing and apparently absurd ambition, and thus had some sense of what to say. One doesn't follow God in hope of happiness, but because one senses, that's a miserable, flimsy little word for that beak in your bowels, a truth that renders ordinary contentment irrelevant. There are some hungers that only an endless commitment to emptiness can feed. And the only true antidote to the plague of modern despair is an absolute and perhaps even annihilating awe. I prayed for wonders instead of happiness, Lord, writes the great Jewish theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel, and you gave them to me. I thought of this moment not long ago when one of my twin, this is a while ago, my twin four-year-old daughters walked wide-eyed and trembly into the, my room at midnight. My wife was traveling. The girls are accustomed to me being gone and have learned to allay their anxieties with the prospect of airport presence, but they are less sanguine about the absence of their mother. So I thought we were doing okay. There had been a vociferous territorial dispute at the kiddie pool and then a principled aesthetic disagreement about the length of my hair. But dinner was nice, and the ice cream bribery was effective. And after story time and poem time and I love you time, I slipped out of their room without a fuss. About an hour later, though, I looked up to find my blonde-haired, blue-eyed, scarily intelligent sprite of a child, Eliza, standing in my doorway. Daddy, she said, I can't sleep. Every time I close my eyes, I'm seeing terrible things. I'm a lifelong insomniac. I used to freak my own parents out when I was a small child by creeping quietly into the room and opening up their eyelids with my fingers in, a, in an effort, so the story goes, to see what they were dreaming. And in fact, I began this very essay between two and four one morning when my thoughts were all a case of knives, to quote the great 17th century poet and priest George Herbert. So I was sympathetic to Eliza's plight. I suggested she pray to God. This was a moment of either great grace or brazen hypocrisy, as I'm not a great prayer myself and tend to be either undermined by irony or overwhelmed by my own chaotic consciousness. Nevertheless, I suggested that my little girl get down on her knees and bow her head and ask God to give her good thoughts. Like the old family house in Tennessee that we'd gone to just a couple of weeks earlier, the huge green yard with its warlock willows and mystery thickets, the river with its primordial snapping turtles and water-bearded cattle, the buckets of just-picked blueberries and the fried Krispy Kremes, and the fireflies smearing their alien radiance through the humid Tennessee twilight. Is it messed up? Oh, yeah, I think I fixed it. You're good. I told her to hold that image in her head and ask God to preserve it for her. I suggested she let the force of her longing and the fact of God's love coalesce into a form as intact and atomic as matter itself. 
to attend to memory with the painstaking attentiveness of a poet, the abraded patience of a saint, the visionary innocence of the child whose unwilled wonder erases any distinction between her days and her dreams. I said all this underneath my actual words, as it were, and waited while all that blonde-haired, blue-eyed intelligence took it in. Oh, I don't think so, Daddy. She looked me right in the eyes. What do you mean, Eliza? Why not? Because in Tennessee, I asked God to turn me into a unicorn, and look how that's worked out. <laughs> what exactly does that mean, to pray? And is it something one ought to be teaching a child to do? And if we assume for a moment that it is an, an essential thing to learn, then what exactly ought one to pray for? A parking space? To be cured of some dread disease? For the emotional and spiritual well-being of a beloved child? To be a unicorn? For one night of untroubled sleep? The Polish poet Anna Kamienska died in 1986 at the age of 66. She had converted to Christianity decades earlier in her 30s after the unexpected death of her beloved husband. People who have been away from God tend to come back by one of two ways, extreme lack or extreme love, an overmastering sorrow or a strangely debilitating joy. Either the world is not enough for the hole that is opened in you or it is too much. The two impulses are intimately related, and it may be that the most authentic spiritual existence inheres in being able to perceive one state when you are squarely in the midst of the other. The mortal sorrow that shadows even the most intense joy, the immortal joy that can give even the darkest sorrow a fugitive gleam. Anna Kamienska, then, a devoted and tormented Catholic, her fate brought her great comfort and great anguish, often at the same time. No doubt this is precisely the quality that attracted me to her when I first came across a couple of passages from her diaries, high in the air above downtown Chicago in Northwestern Memorial Hospital, blood in my tubes and blades in my veins. I had, have, cancer. I have been living with it, dying with it for so long now that it bores me or baffles me or drives me into the furthest crannies of literature and theology in search of something that will both speak and spare my own pain. Were it not for my daughters, I think by this point I would be at peace with any outcome, which is, I have come to believe, one reason, the least reason, but still, that they are here. Not long before her death, Anna Kamienska wrote what I think is her best poem, a stark, haunting, and insidiously hopeful little gem called A Prayer That Will Be Answered. The title is worth some stress in both senses of that word, A Prayer That Will Be Answered. Lord, let me suffer much and then die. Let me walk through silence and leave nothing behind, not even fear. Make the world continue. Let the ocean kiss the sand just as before. Let the grass stay green so that the frogs can hide in it, so that someone can bury his face in it and sob out his love. Make the day rise brightly as if there were no more pain. And let my poems stand clear as a window pane bumped by a bumblebee's head. This is an uncanny poem. It gives God all power, the continuance of the world, and no power. It was going to continue anyway. It is implicitly apophatic, you might say. That is, it erases what it asserts. It is a prayer to be reconciled to a world in which prayer does not work. Ah, my dear God, though I am clean forgot, let me not love thee if I love thee not, wrote George Herbert at the end of his, one of his own greatest poems. We pray God to be free of God, says the 13th century mystic Meister Eckhart. Behind Kamienska's poem, infusing it with an ancient and awful power, is the most wonderful 
and terrible prayer that one can pray. Not my will, Lord, but yours. That's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, of course, before the Roman soldiers come to take him to his death, just before he has sweated blood, begged God to let the cup of suffering pass him by, and wept to leave this world that he has come to love so completely and, it seems, helplessly. Not my will, Lord, but yours. It's difficult enough to pray a prayer like this when you're thinking of making some big life decision. It's damn near impossible when your actual life is on the line or the life of someone that you love. When all you want to pray is help, help, help. Not my will, Lord, but yours. Kamienska's poem is uncanny in another way, too, and triumphant. If you want me again, writes Walt Whitman near the end of Song of Myself, look for me under your boot soles. And this poem has a similar ghosting effect, gives its author a kind of posthumous presence. Let my poem stand clear as a window pane bumped by a bumblebee's head. This, it turns out, has happened. The poem is indeed as clear as a window pane, and we, the readers, all these decades after Kamienska's death, are bumping our heads upon it. The prayer has been answered. And to feel the full effect of this poem is to feel a little ripple of spirit going right through the stark indifferent reality to which the poet sought to be reconciled. For a long time, I tried to write a poem that had as its first line, are you only my childhood? By childhood, I meant not only the encompassing bubble of Baptist religiosity in which I was raised, but also that universally animate energy, that primal permeability of mind and matter that children both intuit and inhabit. The park lives outside, as one of my little girls said to the other when they were going to sleep. That clear and endlessly creative existence that a word like faith can only stain. By you, I meant you with a capital Y. I took dozens of different tacks for the poem, but it was all will and thus all wasted. Years passed. Then recently, in a half-dreaming state in the middle of the night, I heard myself ask the question, are you only my childhood? And from deep within the dream, a voice, it was me, but the voice was not mine, said with what seemed to be genuine interest and puzzlement, why do you say only? Ah, my dear angry Lord, since thou dost love, yet strike, cast down, yet help afford, sure I will do the like. I will complain, yet praise, I will bewail, approve, and all my sour sweet days I will lament and love. George Herbert, again. It's likely he wrote the poem, Bittersweet, it's called, between the ages of 37 and 40, when he had just swerved from a disappointing political career into parish ministry, was newly and very happily married, and obviously dying of tuberculosis. All my sour sweet days I will lament and love. Destitution and abundance Submission to God and aggression against God. What might it mean to pray an honest prayer? Maybe it means, like Meister Eckhart, praying to be free of the need for prayer. Maybe it means praying to be fit for, worthy of, capable of living up to the only reality that we know, which is this physical world around us, the severest of whose terms is death. Maybe it means resisting this constriction with the little ripple of spirit that cries otherwise, as all art, even the most apparently despairing, ultimately does. And maybe, just maybe, it even means praying for a parking spot 
in the faith that there is no permutation of reality too minute or trivial for God to be altogether absent from it. If Jesus' first miracle can be a kind of pointless party trick, he turns water into wine, voila! <laughs> Maybe the lesson we are meant to learn from this is that we have to turn everything over to God, including those niggling feelings and hesitations we have that the whole rigmarole of sifting scripture like bird's entrails and bowing one's suddenly brainless head and believing in something more than matter. This is all just a little ridiculous, isn't it? An embarrassment even, the province perhaps of little children. I can't still tell a story of one daughter without telling a story of the other. Fiona then, the olive-skinned and night-eyed child, the lithe and little trickster sister, Fiona. When our girls were just two years old, we spent a summer in Seattle, where I'd lived many years earlier. It was the first break I'd managed to take from Poetry Magazine in a decade, and it was only eight months after I'd undergone a bone marrow transplant. Time had a texture that summer, an hourly reality that we could taste and see. The girls went to a wonderful little daycare in the morning so my wife and I could write, and then we all came together in the afternoons to do something fun in the city. We adhered to the same nightly ritual that we did at home. I read to the girls and tucked them in before my wife took over. And the last thing I said every night was, I love you, to which they always replied promptly, I love you too, Daddy. But then one night after my declaration, Fiona was silent. She just kept staring at the ceiling. Do you love me too? Fiona, I asked, foolishly. A long moment passed. No, Daddy, I don't. <laughs> oh, Fiona, sweetie, I bet you do. <laughs> Nothing. Well, I said, finally, I love you, Finn, and I'll see you in the morning. And then as I started to get up, I felt her small hand on my arm, and she said dreamily without looking at me like a tiny little Lauren Bacall, I will love you in the summertime, Daddy. I will love you in the summertime. <laughs> I've told this to a couple of people who thought it was heartbreaking, but I was so proud I thought my heart would burst. <laughs> I will love you in the summertime. What a piercing, poetic thing to say <laughs> at two years old. And for weeks, I thought about it. A year later, just after that dream I related just now, I even wrote a poem about it. I will love you in the summertime, which is to say, given the charmed life we were living there in Seattle and all the grace and grief that my wife and I felt ourselves moving through at every second, I will love you in the time when there is time for everything, which is now and always. I will love you in the time when time is no more. Now, do I think that's what my Athena-eyed and mysteriously interior two-year-old daughter meant by that expression? I do not. But do I think that sometimes life and language break each other open to change, that a rupture in one can be a rapture in the other, that sometimes there are, as it were, words underneath the words, even the very word underneath the words. Yes, I do. When Jesus says that you must become as little children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, he is not suggesting that you must shuck all knowledge and revert to an innocence, or worse, the state of helpless dependence that you have lost or outgrown. The operative word in the injunction is become. The Greek word is strepho, which is probably more accurately translated as convert, a word that more explicitly suggests an element of will and maturation. Spiritual innocence is not beyond knowledge, but inclusive of it, just as it is of joy and love, despair and doubt. For the hardiest souls, even outright atheism may be an essential element. 
there are two atheisms of which one is a purification of the notion of God, says Simone Weil. There is some way of ensuring that one's primary intuitions survive one's secondary self, or to phrase it differently, ensuring that one's soul survives one's self, or to phrase it differently, to ensure that one's self and one's soul are not terminally separate entities, to ripen into childhood, as Bruno Schultz puts it. So perhaps one doesn't teach children about God so much as help them grow into what they already know, and perhaps no is precisely the wrong verb. Trying to solve the problem of God is like trying to see your own eyeballs, wrote Thomas Merton. It has been my experience that most adults will either smile wryly at this and immediately agree, or roll their eyes and lament the existence of this benighted superstition that pretzels intelligence into these pointless knots, this zombie zeal that will not die. It has also been my experience that there are on this earth two little children who, if told this Cohen by, their, by a father inclined to linguistic experiments, will walk separately to the mirror and declare that in fact, Daddy, they can see their own eyeballs. <laughs> I want only with my whole self to reach the heart of obvious truths. That's Anna Kaminska, near the end of the fractured, intense, and diamond-like diaries that circle around and around the same obsessive concern, God. I know just what she means. The trouble, though, as her own life and mind illustrate, is that just as there are simple and elegant equations that emerge only at the end of what seem like a maze of complicated mathematics, so there are truths that depend upon the very contortions they untangle. Every person has to earn the clarity of common sense, and every path to that one clearing is difficult, circuitous, and utterly painfully individual. Here's an obvious truth. I am somewhat ambivalent about religion, and not simply the institutional manifestations, which even a saint could hate, but sometimes, too many times, all of it, the very meat of it, the whole damned shebang. Here's another. I believe that the question of faith, which is ultimately separable from the question of religion, is the single most important question that any person asks in and of her life, and that every life is an answer to this question, whether or not she addresses it consciously or not. As for myself, I have found faith to be not a comfort, but a provocation to a life I never seem to live up to, an eruption of joy that evaporates the instant I recognize it as such, an agony of absence that assaults me like a psychic wound. As for my children, I would like them to be free of whatever particular kink there is in me that turns every spiritual impulse into anguish. Failing that, I would like them to be free to make of their anguish a means of peace for themselves or others, or both, with art or action, or both. Failing that, and I suppose ultimately, here in the ceaseless machinery of implacable matter, there is only failure. I would like them to be able to pray, keeping in mind the fact that as St. Anthony of the Desert said, a true prayer is one that you do not understand. Here's that poem. Typically cryptic, God said three weasels, slipping electric over the rocks, one current conducting them up the tree by the river in the woods of the country into which I walked away and away and away. And a moon-blued, cloud-strewn night sky like an x-ray with here a mass and there a mass and everywhere a mass. 
and to the tune of a two-year-old storm of atoms elliptically, electrically alive. I will love you in the summertime, Daddy. I will love you in the summertime. Once in the West, oops, looks like part of that is missing, huh? Oh, part's missing, it's okay. Once in the West, I lay down dying to see something other than the dying stars, so singularly clear, so unassailably there, they made me reach for something other. I said, I will not bow down again to the numinous ruins. I said, I will not violate my silence with prayer. I said, Lord, Lord, in the speechless way of things that bear years and hard weather and witness. That poem aspires to a kind of attention of witness of inanimate things. It's kin to that poem by Anna Kamienska I read in which her life is nothing more or less than the world around her. Simone Weil once said, we possess nothing in the world, a mere chance can strip us of everything except the power to say, I. That is what we have to give to God. In other words, to destroy. There is absolutely no other free act which it has given us to accomplish, only the destruction of the I. That's the end of the quote. This seems to me both right and wrong. It's right insofar as we must give the I to God. It's wrong insofar as she says the I must be destroyed. I think of this process as more the self coming to full fruition. The I at the end of that poem, witness, is shorn of personality, but it's still an I, still a self, a self that can say, Lord, Lord, even if it's in the speechless way of things that bear years and hard weather and witness. What comes next? What comes after a mystical experience of God, which is what witness essentially depicts? Religion, for many people, is what comes next. What sustains one in between the religionless times of direct experience of God? I'm not sure religion can be sustained without some sort of direct experience of God. Abraham Joshua Heschel famously defined faith as faithfulness to the times when we had faith. It's a discipline of memory and hope. I think everyone has some sort of direct experience of God. It can be an art, nature, prayer. It can be communion with another person. But we often are hesitant to label those experiences as such. A few years ago, I noticed a tendency among people that I knew which seemed to me an attempt to answer this question of what's next, and I found myself writing a poem about it. The poem's imagined. It's not a transcription of the details of my life. I find that poets often aren't given the license that fiction writers are, that, that um, poems are expected to be true, and you don't get to make up things. Um, but uh, good poets make things up. And here's the poem. I should say that the poem does mention several popular diet regimes, so paleo and keto, things like that. Uh, and it's meant to be funny. Um, I'm going to say something about humor in poems after this and about life in general, the theological implications of humor. That's another thing that people are wary about in poetry is humor. Uh, but poetry is not always so deadly serious, man. Here's um, all my friends are finding new beliefs. All my friends are finding new beliefs. This one converts to Catholicism and this one to trees. In a highly literary and hitherto religiously indifferent Jew, God womps on like a genetic generator. Paleo, Quito, Zone, South Beach, Bourbon. Exercise regimen so extreme she merges with machine. One man marries a woman 20 years younger and twice in one brunch uses the word verdant. 
another's brick-fisted belligerence gentles into dementia, and one, after a decade of finical feints and teases like a sandpiper at the edge of the sea, decides to die. Priesthoods and beasthoods, sombers and glees, high-styled renunciations and avocations of dirt, sobrieties, satieties, pilgrimages to the very bowels of being. All my friends are finding new beliefs, and I am finding it harder and harder to keep track of the new gods and the new loves and the old gods and the old loves, and the days have daggers and the mirrors motives and the planets turning faster and faster in the blackness and my nights and my doubts and my friends, my beautiful, credible friends. Credible friends. Everything is spinning out of control in this poem, as it often seems to be in life. And the poem reads, oh, sorry about that. I didn't advance it. Here you go. Um, and this poem reaches, and it is the poem that reaches. It's not the poet that reaches. The poem itself reaches for something, the sounds that you are following. It reaches for the one thing that's steadfast and reliable, friends. Forget the crazy beliefs. Forget all of our human efforts to impose a system upon chaotic experience. The days have daggers and the mirrors motives. You get older and the mirrors start having motives. <laughs> and the planet's turning faster and faster in the blackness. And the only thing you can hold on to in this life is relationship. Now, humor. I, I, the poem's not laugh out loud funny, I realize, but it is meant to be a bit buoyant and smilingly ironic, at least during its first half. What's the point of humor? Here's a great quote from the sociologist and religious thinker Peter Berger. Humor not only recognizes the comic discrepancy in the human condition, it also relativizes it and thereby suggests that the tragic perspective on the discrepancies of the human condition can also be relativized. At least for the duration of the comic perception, the tragedy of man is bracketed. Now, I would say that our entire life is, in a sense, bracketed, and religion reinterprets the meaning of the comic and vindicates laughter. That's Berger again. Religion reinterprets the meaning of the comic and vindicates laughter. Humor, then, can be much more than mere comic relief, though sometimes it can just be that, and blessedly that. It can have existential reach and significance, can imply a world in which the comic, not the tragic, is ultimate. Can imply it, at least, for the duration of the comic perception. That's Berger. You can't breeze past that modest qualifier. As with a poem that restores reality to us and us to it, or a moment of joy that makes love seem not just possible but permanent, life or death come flooding back in with all their chaos and contempt for epiphanies. And that moment of comic perception can seem not just slight but actually irrelevant, even offensive. Thomas Hardy thought humor is tragedy if you just look deeply enough into it. And what he meant to do was subsume humor into tragedy to make the latter more comprehensive and final than the former. It is, in the same way that death, as far as we can tell, is more comprehensive and final than life. But I still think Hardy's wrong. Humor doesn't change its nature when submerged in tragedy. It's like a vacancy defect in which a missing atom actually makes the material stronger. That's what a vacancy defect is. A moment of humor can not only maintain its integrity, but determine the strength and cohesion of the whole. This leads me to another poem. It's about laughter, too, sort of, but uh, also very appropriately for this conference, actually, about writing poetry and what that has to do with seeking God. This poem is called Eating Grapes Downward. You need to know that Raleigh Fingers was a famous baseball player in the 1970s. And Samuel Butler was a famous and now mostly forgotten novelist and critic. A, a karategi is the white uniform worn by people practicing karate. And K 
kiai is that little shout that they make when they're practicing karate. Eating grapes downward. Every morning, without thinking, I open my notebook and see if something might have grown in me during the night. Usually, no. But sometimes a tendril tries a crack at my consciousness, and if I remain only indirectly aware of it and tether my attention to the imminent and perhaps ultimately unseeable sun, sometimes it will grow. Inevitably, a sense of insignificance intrudes. I think of all the lives in all the places waiting in their ways for something to grow out of them, into them. Is it the same God? Always eat, oh, sorry, this again got messed up. No, that's not right. No, it's missing, sorry. Is it the same God? I have a cousin whose political opinions vile up out of him on the internet in the most imaginative ways. <laughs> he sports a cartoon mustache like Raleigh Fingers that was a lodestone of enduring awe in my childhood, along with his gift for scissoring bricks with one blow. With his spanking karategi and cowboy kiai, his weasel sleek of hair and handlebars, he was a spectacle there in Midland, Texas, circa 1973, where the sun slammed the blacktop and the pump jacks beaked the background like prehistoric crows. Always eat grapes downward, advises Samuel Butler, a corroded copy of whose notebooks I perused at the backwoods Woodbridge bookstore that seemed somehow already erstwhile, while my daughters fussed and bleated to be outside with the miniature cow Mona, so named because her moo was like a moan. Savor the best grapes first, Butler means, so there will be none better on the bunch, and each will seem delicious to the last. In truth, I don't quite follow the logic, though his conclusion, past 50, everyone eats their days downward, is unassailable. That's also missing. I gotta stop using this. What else? That people who can whistle their speech. My terminal confusion of preterite and predicate. The meanings we live but do not have. Oh, and Mona, who seem less cow than concept, really. Half animal, half irony. Sticking her rubbable muzzle through the fence like a Labrador. We stayed a long while petting the impossibility of her. We gave her, if you can believe it, grapes left over from one daughter's lunch. And when they were gone, and we were almost, her moo blued the air like a sorrow so absurd it left nothing left of us but laughter. The meanings we live but do not have, the meanings we feel in life but can never put in words or realize with ritual or symbol, this poem is about the mad, confusing, and wonderful welter of life out of which poems, and sometimes faith, emerge. It's about the tears of things, lacrimae rerum, as Virgil termed it. The force behind the movement of time is a mourning that will not be comforted. That's Marilyn Robinson in Housekeeping. And yet, the meanings we live but do not have the sorrow so absurd that it left nothing left of us but laughter, which not only re recognizes the comic discrepancy in the human condition, but relativizes it, as Peter Berger said. Now let me end with three very, very short poems that grow out of everything I've said. The first one is actually the next to last entry of my new book, and it comes from Dickinson. No omen but awe. I thought it would all resolve one day in diamond time. 
Life like a gem to lift to the squint as through a jeweler's loop. I thought every facet and flaw, neither facet nor flaw in some final shine. Chance and choice, uncanny cognates, form, fate. Now I am here. No diamond, no time, no omen but awe that a whirlwind could in not cohering cohere. Loss is my gift. Bewilderment, my bow. Bewilderment is a more shadowy word than awe or wonder, but it's the best I can do. What is the final revelation that life grants you? That there will be no final revelation. We live piecemeal lives with a makeshift faith, and poetry for me is one of the things that makes survival and praise possible. It does this, Again, I'm speaking for myself, partly by both eliminating and salvaging the I that Simone Weil said we must get rid of. I have found that there's something in the very sound of language, a word within the word, that makes this possible. Here's a poem that tries to say that. Inevitably, it's called Ars Poetica. A plum and othering dusk, something renunciatory in the light, until the sparrow takes the old tree's shape and the trees untreed are everywhere. If I could let go, if I could know what there is to let go, if I could chance the night's improvidence and be the being this hard mercy means. Two, these lost and charnel thoughts, less thoughts than bits of stun, I suddenly find myself among, that are the me I am when I am not sleeked to reason and pacific despair, speak to me of a pain that saves, some end most ear to shrive the mind some endmost ear to shrive the mind. Shrive means to hear the confession of, to assign penance to, to absolve. Who hears our poems? Why do we write them, even though they often go unpublished and unread? What are we really after? Some endmost ear to shrive the mind. God. God, for me, is that ultimate ear. God is the reason one aims at perfection and the reason that we can live with forever falling short. And now one last very short poem because I want to end with a poem of gratitude, not contingency, praise and not lament. This little poem is called 50. And the first line comes from the Siksa Samakuyaya, which is a Buddhist text. Sounds like I've read it, doesn't it? Renouncing kingship like a snot of phlegm, I go out into the park. I have my death with me, iron friend, and a few feather regrets that one by one lift from me in the wind. I have two daughters and one cloud, an old oak and a great love, elected solitude, given sun. There never was a now, this golden one. Thank you all. Thank you. I know what happened on those slides. It was a, uh, editing. The format and editing had two columns, and we lost the the second column in the in the slide the uh, slideshow part, which is just you know a classic. But 
it's always the whole story of having your words, but also having the tech. But I want to thank Chris for just a really nourishing talk. Thanks for your insights. Uh, we do have time to engage the poet in some comment Q&A, and so Katie and I will pass the mics around. Anybody want to start us off with a thought? Hi. I just wanted to thank you. Your uh, work and your poetry and your essays is a, have been a big part of my life. And you. although we are strangers, um, I just wanted to express my gratitude. No, thank you so much. Hey, can you get, is this still on? Yeah. You can hear me out here. There might not be questions, Mike. Hey, Chris. Do you ever feel pressure, particularly thinking about this in a faith context, to sort of find the resolution, like tidy everything up? I mean, this is so not the way that you write, but do you feel that pressure of like, oh, I have to wrap everything up with a pretty bow? Or are you comfortable with, you know, sometimes it's lament and sometimes it's gratitude and, do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. Um, I do sometimes feel that pressure uh, in certain contexts. I've preached a lot, sometimes feel it then. Um, when you're supposed to bring the good news at the end. Um, but no, in my own life and in most circumstances, I am sort of reconciled to the chaos of it. And uh, this book is about, well, I put it away, but it's, it's, it's very much about that very thing, the need to uh, see your life as a whole, like the urge, I have this urge to see my life as a whole for, to, for it to mean and to look back on all my experience and, and see it as a kind of meaningful pattern to arrive at something. And needless to say, I don't get there in the book, uh, but that's loss is my gift, bewilderment my bow is the last line. So I'm sort of reconciled to it. I wonder if you could speak to the rich tradition of the Psalms of Lament um, and how um, in the Jewish tradition uh, wrestling with, with scripture in ways that Christians sometimes are reluctant to do, um, particularly with some of the uh, difficult passages, but um, particularly in the Psalms of Lament where people, uh, where the psalmist says, God, I thought we had a deal here, and I think I'm holding up my end, and where the heck are you? Um, does that um, resonate with you in, in ways that um, you might elaborate on, or is it just something that I'm thinking of? Oh, uh, no, it does. You know, I, I, um, I was gone from, from religion from church any sense of God not any sense of God that's completely wrong I see that everything I wrote then was obsessed with God but um, but for about 20 years and and then several events led me back and and uh, I had not written poetry for three years I hadn't been able to write a word and the first day that I went to church I, I'm going to get to your question but the first day I went to church, I came home and I wrote a poem that it, uh, for the first time in three years just came out, this complicated formal poem. And, and then I wrote some others after that and I was just delighted and I thought, my gosh, I found this whole new vein and it seems to me poems of presence and poems of praise. And then not long after that, in part of what felt like the same vein of inspiration, I wrote some poems that seemed angry and uh, actually denying God, denying the possibility of God, even poking fun at any idea of heaven. And uh, they were scathing poems. And it was very troubling to me um, because it felt just the same. I felt the presence of God in both of them. 
And, and I finally, it led me to think about it quite a lot, and it led me to see those two things as aspects of a single, a single thing. And um, the way I phrased it then is sometimes God calls a person to unbelief so that faith can take new forms. And that need not be some radical new form of faith. Faith is always taking new forms in our own lives. Every, I don't care how pious you are, faith is always acquiring some new form. And, um, and so I came to see those two things as coextensive, the poems of praise and the poems of lament. Um, and I think the model for that, as you rightly point out, is the Psalms. It's everywhere in the Psalms. I'm actually teaching a course on biblical poetry next in the spring with a Hebrew scholar, and we're looking at uh, poems from the Bible, but also a lot of poems uh, in modern times up to the current moment that come out of the Bible and uh, address that very thing, poems of lament. I'll do one real quick, then we'll go to you, Angela. Um, so a couple of things I picked up in your talk and then some themes in this conference, but you mentioned how faith is an adult, a, a, a mature faith is what uh, <clears throat> is often missing. And thinking how religion can be, religion is rife with problems and habits, but it's an adult sport. Uh, spirituality is an adult sport. And so when you can make your peace with the dynamic of faith and doubt and how it opens up new horizons for me anyway that that opens something up in my own life yeah. and then uh, Mark Burroughs was talking about how a poem an excellent poem could be incomplete because it it said a lot but then there was not saying so much that you want to kind of come back to mm -hmm. and that reminded me of this other kind of dynamic that maybe it's what happens in the gospel too is this dynamic between revelation and concealment. So something's revealed and then something's concealed. And maybe it's that kind of cataphatic, apophatic. But that's the wholeness of it. And I think we all want the complete vision and it can be maybe adolescent or juvenile to insist on having the, the complete vision. And it's more mature and rich when you have the mystery of the maybe incomplete vision, something like that. Yeah, although the irony is that, as I said in that essay, the, uh, a good model for faith is often found in kids. Um, and it's, it's because they don't need words like faith. They don't, they don't need uh, um, a sense, they don't have an impulse to make things whole or even perceive them that way. You have a sense that they're fragmented and, and they simply are experiencing the world, that clear and creative existence that a word like faith can only stain, as I said. And, and uh, I think that's the real irony, that Jesus says you must be like, a little, like little children. I think she had one. Okay, great. Oh, well, thank you so much for your very beautiful presentation. The weaving together of poetry and prose is uh, admirable, beautiful, so thank you. Uh, I loved your last line about your bow, and I couldn't help but think of Keats's last letter where he says when he's dying in Rome of tuberculosis, I always made an awkward bow. And I was wondering if you had Keats in mind, uh, which then led me to wonder, has your experience of dealing with a dreadful disease for all of these years made you feel closer to writers who also have suffered, like Keats from tuberculosis and George Herbert from TB and Flannery O'Connor from lupus and you know a number of uh, uh, Walker Percy who we were talking about earlier with his diagnosis of TB early. Do you feel as though you get those writers and have an affinity with them that you might not have had otherwise? Interesting question. Um, yeah, you know, it's I, my whole, my life for the last, I mean, I'm so lucky to be alive. My life for the last 19 years has been defined by having this. And I just had an experimental, I was telling Mike, I just had an experimental uh, form of bone marrow transplant in March. And I was dead. And it, and it just, um, it worked. And so it's, it's been constant, just constant. 
and has, I mean, that it does affect everything you think, everything you do. It's just, it's just constant. Um, I hadn't thought of Keats in that, but that's a good connection. Uh, I, some writers, it does, I think, make a difference. I, uh, I, di I, I do feel a kinship with Flannery O'Connor, because she says that illness is the only place I've ever, only country I've ever known, or the only place I've ever been, or something like that. I've only ever known one uh, kingdom called illness. I forget how she phrases it, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, de definitely with, with her, she may be, she, she's the only one who really comes to mind right now that I am I'm aware of having felt that kinship with. Hassan, can you hear it all right? I can probably you, hear it. Oh. You, you mentioned Abraham Heschel a couple of times, and I wanted to tell you a, a quote from him. He was a mentor to me. Oh, wow. As a Christian, um, in 30 years difference. And at one point at Newsweek, we were writing a cover story on death. So I called him up to ask him about that. In my own mind, as a Catholic, was a sense of security. You may go one place, you may go another, whatever. So on. And his response to me, and I was telling you this because I think, because I'd love to get your response. And he said to me, Ken, I trust the God who made me to do with me what he will. And it's stuck with me ever since. Do I trust the God to make me, uh, uh, who made me to do with me what he will? It seems to me there's a whole profound spirituality in there that very often Christians don't don't pick up. I, I don't know if you resonate with that at all. Very much, yeah. I, I, I do think that uh, I love that idea of faith um, as being a kind of trust. Fanny Howe, who's a writer who's meant an enormous amount to me, um, says that she describes somewhere her sense of faith is uh, she just has this sense that we are safe. Amid it all, amid all the devastation, amid the impossibility of that, there is this sense in her heart that we are safe. And I think that's kin to that statement that uh, one ought to learn to trust God to do whatever God will. I can't claim to inhabit that space, but uh, I am more aware of it. I do, I do understand it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, in particular for a um, note you made toward the end of your presentation when you spoke about the ear that uh, uh, listens to all those words gathered together that may not find their way to uh, any publication. And I, I wondered if you could say more about the gift furnished by that ear, and if there's any way in which it tells us something about the ear, we can furnish uh, a fellow poet or or someone else otherwise. I didn't quite understand that. That, that uh, just as we find and turn our writing over to an ear that listens and attends to us, is there some? What is? Can you say more about that gift that that ear furnishes us? And then does that uh, tell us something about our own capacity to listen uh, and the gift we could furnish a fellow poet uh, as oh. we listen to the word that they uh, have to bring to the world? Yeah, that's a great point. I hadn't thought of that, but that, that, that the action that we do for each other of genuinely attending to a, someone else's poem can be a, a mirror of God's attention to us. Um, um, Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in the eyes, not his, to the Father, through the features of men's faces. So it's that idea, but um, Paul says, faith comes through hearing, and uh, interesting quote, 
for me, I, I, um, I'm so driven by my ear. The, I've never written a poem that was not a piece of sound first, often a piece of rhythm even that doesn't have words yet. It's just a piece of rhythm. And these things get stuck in my head and then they, they become something else, even when they're not, some of them are not heavily what you'd think of as musical. Um, but it's always sound. And so, yes, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that there is something inherent in the very sound of language that is divine. And, and I had not thought of, but I love that idea that we are emulating uh, God's action when we pay that kind of attention to another person. I think it's very, e it's very easy to think, um, you know, poetry just doesn't matter to anybody. And, you know, what, that, what the priest said, you know, just <laughs> blows it off. Um, um, and I go through it, everybody goes through it. I go through it, I, I often feel like nobody's reading this. I don't have any readers. Everybody I know goes through this. You don't hear from people, you don't, you know, you write these things, maybe you publish them, you don't hear anything. And everybody goes through with it. Uh, I am convinced that there is some fundamental divine importance in the act of writing a poem, no matter who's doing it, that it matters. It, it, it matters just as much as you know, when these oil companies talk about destroying a tree, trees somewhere way up in the Arctic where nobody would ever go, and they, they think, well, it can't possibly matter. It matters for exactly the same reason. It's a piece of existence. It is integral to the unity of existence. It has its place, and it matters. And I am, I am, I've learned to console myself with that notion. I feel it as a consolation, uh, even though I can fall back into, oh, nobody reads poetry. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. It was wonderful, mm -hmm. and I do read your words. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if there are some subjects, some poems that should be kept to ourselves or just for ourselves, or if any subject can be explained, explored in poetry. And the, where this, this question comes from is, um, I wrote a poem lately that had to do with my brother, who has cut off all communication and just sent very cursing remarks to me when I try to ask him why. It basically has to do with, well, I won't go into it, but it's deeply distressing. And I wrote a poem that, you know, was exploring what he does and why this could have come to be. And the response of one poet, po poet to this poem was, is judgmental. Well, if there is some moral fiber to the universe, then is there a place in poetry sometimes for it to be judgmental? You know, we have imprecatory psalms, but you know, our, our modern world doesn't like that kind of language. So what would be your response to that? Oh my gosh, there's so much poetry that's judgmental. I mean, like Alexander Pope wrote scathing judgmental poems about people. Uh, there's, there's or you know, uh, people here love Denise Levertov. I've heard her mention several times. She was my teacher. Um, uh, she wrote a lot of judgmental poems really passing judgment on people. Uh, no, I think poetry definitely, it contains all range of human emotion. It can, be, it can be scathingly judgmental. I don't see that as a necessary critique. It could be that, you know, a person can be judgmental. Uh, we think of that as always pejorative. Um, and I guess if it's, if it's, if it's coming across that way in a poem, maybe it's, maybe it's, uh, deforming the emotion or something, I don't know, but good Lord, when I think of Alexander Pope, you'd think, this is not a nice guy. I mean, I mean he may have been, but in his poems, they're, they're scathing. We have time for two more, we have one here, and then we'll one here. Is it on? Oh, hey. Thank you, Christian. Oh, it was great. I love this poem right here. I'm glad it's still up there. Yeah. And I, you thought about faith, being childlike, but also as adult, what does that mean? And my sense of this is, this is one day. We renounce kingship uh, the next day. It, it, it may not be there, but I really love that. And I wonder if it's an, uh, a, 
semi-allusion to Hopkins in elected solitude. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because that's the elected will. Loyola talks about the uh, affective and the elective, and sometimes it's just, this is what I'm doing today. Yeah, I'm I think going. that's a great point. You know, um, Wallace Stevens used to say, people would come to him and say, you know, you uh, complain about his philosophy being inconsistent, saying we can't make sense of this. You say this here and you say this here. And he said, I feel this one day, I feel this the next. <laughs> and, just, and yes, I think that's exactly, that's one day. There never was a now this golden one, but just, it, yeah. Uh, I wanted to thank you and express my gratitude as well, um, in particular for editing and curating Joy, mm. which is just such a service to the world and to me. Um, and that book, I um, had a experience of God uh, like a long-standing relationship and experience with God, which left me, and I no longer believe in God. And that book uh, has been uh, has stepped into the to the gap um, that I that uh, arose when I lost my faith. And. Um, Mostly, I just want to say that, and I want to express my gratitude. And I'll just say, if you want to respond to this, that the thing that's so amazing about so many of those poems is their meditations on impermanence and on um, how the sorrow of impermanence can sit immediately adjacent to or give rise to joy. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's just such an amazing piece of work, that collection. So thank you very much for it. No, oh, thanks for letting that. He's talking about an anthology I did just called Joy 100 Poems. I did another one called Home, but uh, the Joy one was particularly uh, joyful. It was, it was really a wonderful project um, and led me to really, I did it because I wanted, anytime I need to think about something, I, I do it through the lens of poetry. It's kind of the only way I can think. That's why there's all these poems scattered throughout my prose is that it, it, it becomes the window that I look through these poems. But, but uh, yeah, that was a really important book for me, actually, that, that um, anthology of joy. I'm delighted to hear that it stepped into that place for you. Um, yeah, that word belief, I don't, I'm kind of tired of the word belief. I think you can have belief in God and not have faith. And I sometimes think that you can uh, not believe in God and have faith. I'm, it's a paradox. Okay, thank you all. Thank you.